Uh, and whether you're crap, crapping, crapping. Whether, whether you're cracking open a new cold one, oh no, whether you're cracking open a cold one on a, on at a mountain summit, get out of here. This is exhausting. Whether I thought you weren't reading anymore. I have been always glancing. <laughs> wonder how a groundbreaking gel could change how you consume alcohol or how the Kelsey brothers are getting their setting their mark on the beer industry this week welcome to the body by beer podcast my name is Chelsea and this is my best friend hey everybody I'm Liz and this week's episode we're going to dive into the heart of the craft beer industry with some super duper exciting brew news one of our favorites, and we're going to have an inspiring interview with Mike Myers from Root Shoot Malting, and we're going to get into the art of malt mastery. <laughs> Super exciting. You're going to love it. Plus, like every other week, we're going to tantalize your taste buds with some perfect beer and food pairings. And last but not least, we're going to get into some quirky truths about the Colorado craft beer scene and some things that people don't often warn you about when drinking in Colorado. Don't always get warned about those things. We're packing a lot into this episode, guys. So grab your favorite brew. Join us for this episode of insights, surprises, and uh, some pretty sweet knowledge overall. Uh, today, I am drinking from our Beer Mug Club of the Month box, this Schwartz beer from this German brewery, of which I cannot pronounce. So feel free to zoom in on that sucker and pronounce it however you would like. Do you want to give it a shot? Because I didn't. Let me see. Let me see. Kustreitzer? Schwartz beer. Cool Schwartz. Maybe. Yeah. I'm also drinking out of our Beer of the Month Club box, and this is the Sarka Pilsner from Jackalope Brew in N -N -N Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. Uh, we thank both beers for joining us in the Beer of the Month box <laughs> club. Yeah, we uh, didn't make it to them we on our national journey. It was the one of the breweries we really wanted to get to, and the days we were there and the days were, they were closed just didn't pan out. But anyways, we get it now. Who would have known? The beer knows. And it's still delicious coming out of a can, so no judgment necessary. There you go. All right. All so, right. link Let's below for the Mug Club of the Beer Month if you would like to join that. But for now, we're going to jump into the Brew News. Uh, welcome to Brew News, uh, your go-to source for the craft beer industry's latest and most trending Articles, news, stories, all the things. Uh, each way we bring, each week we bring to you up to date on the hottest stories in brewing, in brew news, and stories going around and within the industry, and you know, sprinkle in a little bit of our own opinions. That's the best news it is. <laughs> uh, number one, uh, we're talking about a new gel mm. that breaks alcohol down for your in, hair in the body. Oh no. Yeah. So, essentially, in a nutshell, and I may go off on a tangent here, so fair warning, uh, this new gel is essentially designed to break down the alcohol in your digestive system before it reaches the bloodstream. Ooh. Why does that matter? matter? Surprise, surprise, because alcohol overall isn't that great for your body, right? It doesn't fuel it in a positive way. What it does to the brain, right, is it, as most of us know, is it releases that dopamine, gives us that euphoric state of mind, but it's a catch-22, yep. right? Yep. Like most habits, addictions, whatever you want to call it, that feeling of euphoria, it, it only lasts so long, right? And you can never get that high again. And eventually more alcohol leads to less pleasant thoughts and mm. emotional swings like anger, <laughs> depression, etc. So that, uh... gel, breaking down alcohol in the body. While I support entrepreneurship, yeah. I kind of do the... <clears throat> on this one i don't really care that's no offense to them yep. good for them go out and get it it's an innovative innovative approach to just getting in on the entrepreneurship yeah. game but but it's hard for me because if you don't if you don't want to drink don't drink right or figure out a way to drink in moderation right and i think that's always going to be the ultimate advice um so ultimately with these you're just you're just drinking to enjoy the flavors, which is yeah. great, right? And that's that's a big part of the art of the craft brew industry, yeah, is right? It's like cool. enjoying those flavors beyond yeah. just this I want to get drunk type yeah. of mentality. Yeah. And I get that. I do too. So there's that. Um 
So for me, it just breaks down into like the gel. It depends on your perspective of what healthy is. Yeah. Is is really kind of where I went off here. And for example, it's like spending all week telling myself these terrible negative thoughts and and then expect to go to my therapist and I'm going to feel better after two hours or an hour, how much I can afford to pay them that week, that they're going to make me feel better, right? Which isn't true, which ultimately at the end of the day, I have to stop telling myself these negative hot thoughts yeah, in, in yeah. order to start feeling better, yeah. right? So that's how I feel about gel breaking alcohol down in the body. Yeah. So if, if, if I just want that flavor, then I should just go and have it for the flavor, right? And not worry about alcohol effects on the body. Or again, in moderation. Or again, in moderation. Yeah. Again, not to poo-poo on these guys. It's a cool article. It's a cool thing they're doing. I'd be, not my cup of tea. I'd be interested, like, long run, what other studies or discoveries come out of it because of it. I, I, I can see mm-hmm. this being, like, the first step to solving a bigger problem, but this isn't necessarily like, the dream bigger problem they're solving. It's just, like, making sure it's working. I don't know. I, I mean, I don't so, know what that next step would be, but I could see where maybe there's something, like, bigger and bolder in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I'll give them one more kudos. Uh, it is, like, all made out of, like, whey protein, basically. Yeah. They're just so freaking... Get jacked. Get jacked. So I was it. like, so I should just drink more protein shakes? Yeah. Question mark. That's interesting. That would have been a great one for Dr. Dan when we yeah. asked. Articles included below in the link, as it usually is. So yeah. looking forward to your thoughts yeah, on so. that. And our second brew news story of this week is about Athletic Brewing. And we've talked to them before, about them before. Uh, but this one's a little bit special because they just took over the Ballast Point headquarters in California. Right. Which is massive. Mm-hmm. Right. So, I mean, a lot of people joked and never would have thought that NA beers would have come to fruition, kind of similar to eating a gel that makes the NA, <laughs> makes the makes the beer NA within your own body. Right. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, not only are they number one non-alcoholic beer sales in the nation, probably the world, um, but the 10th largest craft brewery in by volume in the country. And they've seen a whopping 62% growth year over year since last year. Um, and now they're hitting us with another bombshell. They've taken over this massive facility in California. It's a 107,000 square foot facility. Huge. Canadians. Huge. Uh, which includes a 300 barrel and 150 barrel brew house, a cellar, packaging line, a Q&A lab, business offices, and a bar and restaurant component. Mm, getting fancy. Oh, yeah. Uh, the goal is to fully utilize the space with additional brand new state of the art packaging, which yeah. is capable of doing... 1,200 cans per minute. Wow. Because they're kicking so much ass yep. that they're just like sloughing yep. out cans like crazy. I know just, there's some in the fridge upstairs. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, and, you know, getting new brewing technology to enhance sustainability. Go them. Love that. Reduce the water consumption. Uh, and, and increase the maximum brewing, which currently is about half a million. And they're doubling that to a million barrels per year. That is wild. It's huge. That's it's so a, it's a massive in increase. They're not taking it over right away. No. It's about a year and a half-ish Something that they're like going to take over. Yeah. Someone is still doing the the Ballast Point Brewing. It's a contract brewing. They haven't announced it, so it's still going on. Yeah. Still some pieces, but, I mean, the big takeaway is, is they're still growing so much in a craft beer space that is kind of yeah. struggling, and they're, they're kicking some major ass. So yeah. kudos to them. That's awesome. That's a huge growth. That's a huge facility. Maybe mm-hmm. someday we can go take a tour. Oh my gosh, that would be amazing. That'd be cool, huh? Yeah, that's that's Jeez. that's incredibly impressive. Yeah. I mean, five hundred thousand barrels a year is no freaking joke in and of itself. But to yeah. go to over a million, right? Like, I wonder if that takes them out of craft. I don't remember where the barrel space is for craft. Hmm. Mm. And I've said it before, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's a huge growth and great for them. And just what an, I just I can't imagine putting that kind of own investment back into yourself. That's just, it's crazy. That's huge. That's a big ass building. And we were talking about how, you know, the grapefruit IPA was such like a groundbreaker in the IPA world. Yeah. Just yesterday. Yeah. Uh, uh, we were talking about the Mount Rushmore of IPAs, and right? That one, the, and yeah. yeah that on there. The Sculpin. Yeah. And yeah. now they're like no moss, the contract brewing. It's crazy. Hmm. Crazy world. There you go. Anyways. Anyway, good good for the NA industry, right? It proves a, a huge point, yeah. right? Like, yeah, I mean, it just, that that's just growth and evolution right there, right? Like, the people chose not to drink, so 
guess who moves into the largest, one of the larger facilities, right? Especially on mm-hmm. the West Coast. Yeah. All right. Good for them. Pretty cool. Way to go, athletic. Mm. Uh, okay. So we got to tag team this one a little bit. That's so fair. We're going to talk about the Kelsey brothers. Why? Well, because everybody else does. So we wanted to get in on the fun. But this is also super fun. Ultimately, we're trying to catch their attention. Chelsea sent them a very lovely email. We want to do a beer challenge with them. So we're shouting that back out to them. That's good. Um, I'm scared. But what we're here to tell you about today is that the famed brotherly duo has taken a controlling interest in the garage beer brand you may have read about this you may have seen this you may have heard this yep. they are basically anti-ipa it's all yep. about it's all about light lagers right and you bet your ass the punishment when they lose is going to be drinking a bunch of ipas <laughs> so investing in the beer industry right now i wouldn't necessarily say is a slam dunk but it's not not yep. uh, a bad move all right especially when you consider that Americans are still now searching for their favorite light lager, right? Why wouldn't you jump all over that? Tivoli. Tivoli jumped all over that, right? Like, literally, people are trying to find the next light lager. Yeah, and Modelo had its uh, time in the spotlight. It's not not in the sun, right? So to speak. Motherfucking Hulk Hogan, America's (laughs) real beer. He jumped on it. All I can think about is uh, actually at... Remy, stop. Leave it. Just so happy right now. I know, but she's doing a whole flow on this. Okay. It's going to be all choppy. Cut. Are you done? Yeah. Anyways. Go on to the next Ashley. one. Yeah, but it's not going to cut well. All right. Uh, shoot. Where was it? Okay. Uh, okay. Kelsey Brothers. Okay, so... I don't even know how to get... Okay. So, like, there's this overwhelming urge to jump into that light lager, like, uh, spotlight, yeah. right? To be America's light lager brew. So, as we all know and have come to love, the Kelsey Brothers have made a name for themselves in the podcast world. Not to mention their multiple Super Bowl championship rings. Well, that, not, not Jason, but Travis. Sorry, not sorry, Jason. He's but got one. Uh, he, yeah, he's got one. He doesn't have multiple. Then he Just lost saying. It. Yeah. He had lost his ring. Yeah, we'll get to that later. Okay. We won't, but we, you and I can get to that later. Anyway, so from my point of view, they are the epitome of all American brothers from opportunistic Ohio. Yeah. Genetically built for America's game of football. They love it. So you can't argue with their passion. Oh, and they're actually pretty good. Remember we said Super Bowl championship rings. <laughs> so uh, these all American brothers really embody that that frat guy, that party guy, that dad right like jason is like such a good dad so i feel like girl dad. he's a girl dad and of course they love light lagers right it's the classic american dream beer they represent a classic american dream why wouldn't they represent a classic american light lager yeah. you mow the lawn with it you watch sunday sports with you it. Shotgun it you shotgun it you celebrate with it for them and they invest in it that's how all american those guys are yeah i love it <laughs> anyway, it's a great. It's I had a, a really piece. fun time uh, thinking about that today. <laughs> how, was, how American, how American it, is. it is! Like it's it's right next it's to Hulk beautiful. Hogan. Well, you know, like <laughs> Hulk's a little old, but I dig it. I like it. Yeah, I watched a lot of WWE uh, growing up. Anyway, so I hope they get more involved than just being uh, the brandery. Like like Ashley talked at Ashley from Beerstadt talked about when we did her interview that. They're right. not just going to, like, go up and do the, like, oh, let me, like, drink off the tank and really have nothing involved with it. And instead, like, really support and embrace the community because it is a really beautiful, great community. And, really and I hope they We're can sit in and, and appreciate that and, and be part of it. And, yeah, like, we want to challenge them. We are challenging them to a sports beer drinking challenge. And I don't know if you guys we'll saw my beer chug. See that right there? I'm not scared of shotgun and a beer. I just did a softball a couple nights ago. I, I am. Don't ask me to do it. Yeah, Liz It'll isn't doing that. Me. Yeah. But anyway, like, it's a virtual <laughs> challenge, and we want to raise funds for a good cause, yep. really support diversity and women within the space, and, and get their backing. I mean, they not not only are do they have the capacity of making a big difference in the space, but including being extra supportive for minority groups and showcasing the, their support and expanding the space. And we all know that this space has room to grow. It just needs a little shake up. 
And so I love it. I'm super excited about it. I hope they get back to us. I hope I get to beat Jason in a chug. We saw Either Travis. We saw him try to chug that beer on the stand. That wasn't that impressive. <laughs> Let's go, Jason. <laughs> Guess what I'm not going to do? Challenge him on how far to throw a football. No. Or a push-up challenge. Yeah, that's not going to freaking happen. We thought about a push-up challenge. I was like, that's a terrible idea. We can I do chance. it from my knees? So maybe like we do squats and they do push-ups and maybe we can win. I could probably hang in a squat challenge. Well, if they're doing push-ups. Exactly. <laughs> all right. All right. Anyways. Yep. Anyway. That's super everybody. excited for that. It was fun. Can't wait to tag him. Let's go. All right. You get number four. Oh. <laughs> so much fun. Oh, yeah. We have a sad story, blah, blah, blah. But he died, right? Yeah, he died. hospital. I was passing because he was placed in a trust for his children, but the trust cannot finish his We can keep it or lose it. I just, I feel like. And, we and we probably have cut. pictures from here. We should. Yeah, I put them in the folder. Oh, thank you. Two yeah. of them. Thank you. Not of our faces. So you would have to look for yours. I try to include a lot more pictures of you and I doing things since it cool. is our podcast. Yeah, and we have been to a lot of places. We've done a lot of shit. We've drank a lot of beer. So, up to you if you want to leave. Yeah, I think we'll put it in. Just like right. it's got a burp. Oh, my God. Sam, that is not meant to be put in there. There was a troll <laughs> that emerged from beyond the bar. <laughs> okay, well, Liz made it funny again. <laughs> Patreon behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> all right so in our final story of the brew news is a little bit sadder note uh cascade brewing in portland which is a brewery that we have been to and we absolutely love because as you guys know we absolutely love sours yep. especially in the summertime and they are shutting the doors most likely not permanently. Most uh, likely permanently. You do. I. I okay. Yeah, it's kind of leaning that way. Is it leaning that way yeah. now? I know before when I was reading that, it wasn't quite leaning that way. Basically, the the owner passed away. Super yeah. sad. Uh, he left the brewery to his kids, uh, in in you a know, trust. In a trust, and they can't financially support to continue the operations. Yeah. Um, it's a bummer. You know, it's like the House of Sours yep. in Portland. So yep. I'm, the reason I'm optimistic is maybe it doesn't stand to their name is that I have a hard time believing someone won't pick it up. Like, it's such an iconic brewery. They've done such incredible beers yep. that, like, yep. I'd be super, super sad to, to see that, that not happen. I mean, you Sours, know, I feel like, point. have kind of dwindled, but yeah. man, Sours are so good. Yeah, they're saying Sours are dead. But mm. I don't know about that. I hope not. But, but I like that up. you said that. Um, again, the article is below if you want to read into it. I definitely read, it, read into the more poignant part of the story in that, like, the kids, like you said, just couldn't financially support it anymore. Yeah. But also, like, apparently there was supposed to have been a sale of, the brewery and brew house like four years ago mm. but the details of it were never finalized COVID, you know yeah exactly and i was like well get your will done you know make sure that shit's cleaned up before you die and but you did. don't know when and that's did. gonna happen yeah. you know i'm guessing he, it wasn't that old yeah he was 80 oh well i mean that's he's older that's up there. <gasps> so that's my dog that's my <laughs> anyway yeah. um Sounded like so, you were saying that about the old man. Yeah, oh, that's my dog. <laughs> my dog blue. <laughs> Aren't I going go way back? That's not true. But 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 I will blue say like <laughs> like that is definitely a place that sticks out to me for sours, right? So that was like the summer yeah. of 2017. I hadn't had a whole lot of sours at that yeah. point, point. Uh, and then uh, yeah, it was a couple years then until we actually went to Cantillon and Trace Fontaine oh. over in Belgium. So, like, I got I got to kind of put that in, like, one of the first big sours that yeah. I ever had. You know, and we also went to uh, uh, the brewery over there that year as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Nightmare Oof. on Breath Street. Not brand place. What place is that from? The, the brewery. That's what I just said. Yeah, the brewery is, they have the big dark sour, but it's not Nightmare and Brett. Nightmare. Who does Nightmare and Brett? It's local here. I think it's like, it's not Odell. It's Belgium, maybe. Odell. Mm. Well, anyway. Anyway, you can cut that last part, but I really think it's oh, important. Oh, Crooked State. Crooked State. Well, sure. I thought they were hiring, actually. I was like, hmm. Yeah. Anyway, they're definitely a core memory for yeah. sours. I can't me. remember the name of that dark sour. That was like my favorite dark sour. I thought it was Nightmare on Brett. No. No, that's what I usually get locally because it's like the best local dark sour from Crooked. I mean, the not brewery. just from Crooked. But, anyway. um, yeah, I can't. Uh, oh, 
Oh, no, lost it. It'll, it'll come to me randomly. I'll shout out the name in the, the podcast. Ah, remembered. <laughs> what is she talking about? All right, let's conclude our brew news. Brew news I think that turned out really well. We're okay. We don't want to redo anything. Oh, All right, cool. Uh, so yeah, so that's it for this week's episode of the Brew News. I hope you guys enjoyed the topics and the latest updates from around the craft beer world. Because we did, for the most part. Mine is the Cascade Brewing. Um, awesome. <laughs> if you have any topics to cover or feedback from today's segment, feel free to reach out. Don't forget to subscribe and tune in to next, next, next week for more exciting news and insights. And don't forget to check out our brand new merch. I spent time redoing this G-Dang website. is a very frustrating process. <laughs> Redesigned the logo name into a really, really dope shirt. I've That's already got my order in. It's yeah. going to be here next week. And uh, you guys better freaking out get some of these shirts. They are so... You'll love them. They're so cool. You gotta go check them out. You gotta check them out. Yeah, a lot yeah. of work went into those guys. You're get totally gonna shirts. love them. Get some shirts. Links below. Get Links some shirts, below. please. Alright. This is a little long one. But we really gotta build it up. I have to read the whole thing. Why would you make me read okay, the whole I thing? I will read at this week. Okay? The second one. I, don't, I think it was a typo. Oh, okay. We have two Okay. My family, my family, house. Sister, my family, my friends, and four friends preserving local art preserve while producing some of the finest malts for craft breweries and distillers in the Rocky Mountain region. Let's do it. All right. Can't wait. Oh, I got a burp again. It's a very burpy beer, making me burp a lot. They added some more malts into it. No, not funny. I almost spit my beer. It wasn't not funny. You just didn't see my reaction. Malts, malts, hops. There she was, just walking down the street, singing to what it is. She looked good. She looked fine. Oh, you done? <laughs> yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> All right. After that, brew news. Let's uh, get into our main segment, our industry interviews. Uh, and today we have a very special guest that we're going to show you as we dive into the world of craft malting with Mike Myers from Root Shoot Malting Root here Shoot. in Colorado. Uh, Root Shoot Malting is not only it's not just any malting house; it's a fifth generation family farm that has been at the forefront of preserving local agriculture while producing some of the finest uh, malts for craft beers and craft breweries and craft distilleries in the Rocky Mountain region. That's right. So we're going to explore really the genesis story of Root Shoot. I feel like it's important to many, many stories, especially if you're not familiar with these guys in particular. And we're going to uncover this meticulous process and how important it is, how you get these high-quality malts, yeah. malts out of the deal. And we're going to discuss their mission to preserve farmland um, for future generations. Uh, plus, we're going to touch on really the nitty gritty of packing and shipping their product from small but very, very mighty operations. We're talking incredible. seven people run that place. It's incredible. They're incredible people. Truly. Love their mission. We hope you enjoy this week's episode with Root Shoot Malting. Been very exciting to be part of, you know, leading the revolution of what's going on in that craft malting space. Just so you know, this is the most awarded craft malt house in the world. And that is such a beautiful place to start. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty cool. To, uh, go ahead and say hello to our viewership let them know who you are and then maybe get into a little bit of that Genesis story that we were talking about okay um, my name is Mike Myers I came on at the very beginning once they started to get a foothold and started to sell some malt here and basically stepped in to help run the full operations which goes all the way from delivering uh, grain to cleaning the vessels to packaging to making the grain so 
Um, I've been here for, from the beginning pretty much, which has been pretty exciting to see. Heck yeah, oh my mm -hmm. gosh. Anything from the ground up, I feel like yep. it's always worth it. Mm -hmm. um, give us a little bit then a background. Um, I know why I'm excited to be here. I feel like you've kind of gotten that hint. Um, you're the most awarded. Yep, the most awarded craft malt house in the world. Uh, we've been recognized 11 times for the quality of grain coming out of this facility. Um, through the Craft Malt uh, Guild, they host a competition yearly and we've been recognized uh, 11 times, but every single year that they've had the competition. So it's been, uh, it's been very exciting to be part of, you know, leading the revolution of what's going on in that craft malting space. Okay, I, I, I think that's a really good segue into what does that mean to be leading the market? We want to provide high quality grain to the brewers and distillers and we saw a, a void in the marketplace. Okay, so the Olander family has been farming for a really long time. Really, They're, long time. really long time. They're a fifth generation family farm. So you start to wonder, how does a fifth generation family farm become the most awarded craft malt house in the world in, in a decade? In the world? In wow. The world. Yeah. That's bonkers. Yeah. Well, the secret is in their tagline, actually. It comes down to three simple words. So, grow deliver. There's a lot of meaning behind those three simple words. Yeah. Seemingly simple. Yeah, and they live up to them. Todd and his parents were visiting New Belgium and a couple other regional specific breweries and they were talking to the brewers and the conversation went something like, where are you getting your grains from? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were getting them imported from Europe. Yeah. And the family has been on this plot of land for almost a hundred years. We hit our hundred year mark in just a couple of years for the farm, the century mark, okay. which is pretty exciting. Absolutely. Uh, but during that hundred years, we've grown barley for Anheuser-Busch and Coors for about 50 of those years. So okay. we were growing high quality barley for some of the biggest producers of beer in the world, or at least in America at yeah. least. Um, and so there was just this, you know, disconnect. Well, the family thought, well, we can grow high quality barley. Maybe we can malt it. And there's no local provider for any of those malted materials to the brewing industry. And if you think about it, Fort Collins at that time is, and it still is considered the Mecca of beer. So yeah. there was just this giant void of a wow. local producer and the family thought, Hey, this is this is a pretty good idea. Yeah. Let's move forward. And through some of those conversations with those original breweries, um, the feedback that they gave us was that if the, if the product wasn't good and if it wasn't consistent, then they just weren't interested in it. And so that led a lot of the thinking uh, from the family of how to build this operation. Okay. So we looked at a bunch of malting equipment and we uh, Todd flew to Germany, Todd and his dad, to look at some of this uh, equipment that we now operate on. And at that time, it was, I mean, our, our equipment is considered the Cadillac for craft malting. Uh, what year did what year did that start kind of taking oh, place? Geez, maybe like 20 or 2015, maybe even earlier Dang. is when those original conversations happened. So, I mean, it took us a while to source the equipment to find out what we're really gonna do to build the building, yeah. to you know do all those things. So the groundwork was years before that, and just thinking about it and you know observing what was going on in our backyard cool. in the brewing industry. So you're talking about over the realm of the last decade and, and, and here you are mm -hmm. and still no one, Troubadours started, so, so they came after, right? So, so you started. Colorado and now Malting still is the original Colorado. I, I, I would credit them with being the first craft maltster maybe in America. Uh, so okay. those guys truly in Alamosa are leading okay. the way. Yeah. Uh, they set all the footprints, you know, they led the way, but we came after those guys. And I, I'm not clear on the timing of Troubadour, but we're pretty close to those yeah. guys. So. Okay. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I can imagine like, being like, okay, we've grown this for mm -hmm. 50 years, you said? Yeah. Barley for Anheuser-Busch and then... Coors, yeah. Wow, and Coors. Yeah. Originally, our the farm was built to do custom harvesting. That's what we were doing. Right. So we actually purchased like the large format 
tractors to help f other farmers around us. And that's how we kind of like got into that custom sure. farming, custom harvesting yeah. program. And then we've since um, shifted a little bit of that. You know, I think the family saw, um, saw an opportunity to start filtering some of the small grains through the malt house okay. to start relieving it instead of moving those items into like the commodity market where mm. the value of it is completely uh, unpredictable. So corn could be really high one year and really low the next yeah. year. And yeah. you know, you're kind of at the mercy of what's going on in that commodity market that you have no yeah. control over. Yeah. Right. And so that's kind of yeah. the idea of the mall having the farm. So this operation will always be a farm first. We're a farm family farm, hundred years. If we farm stuff awesome. and then we filter all the small grains that we're growing through this operation that are, we're then relieving out in the marketplace into the breweries and distilleries. Everywhere. Okay. So. so farm and filter mm -hmm. farm malt house, Farm. So we, we sow, we grow, and we deliver. That's cool. kind of our tagline. Love that. Okay. So you really can't deny the amount of passion that is literally just oozing from this farm. You also can't deny the quality of the malt this family is producing, right? Look at all the medals. Look at all the awards. Look at all the recognition. I guarantee, at least I'd be willing to place some money on it, if you've had a beer in the state of Colorado you've probably had a beer with malt that comes from this farm. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense, right? I mean, and this farm must be huge, right? They have to own so much land to be helping out and hitting up so many local breweries to be the malt people for Coors, for AB and Bed for the last 50 years. And like I said, all, all of the new local craft beer that boomed up over the last decade. Right, you would think so, yeah. right? It you has would think, to be. You would think so. But the truth is, is they only own actually a couple of hundred of acres but they actually farm over 2,000 acres. Wow. So it actually puts them in this really vulnerable position, if you start to think about it, at being at the will of people selling out their farmland to developers. And to each their own, you gotta do what you gotta do, because to sell out to them, it's, it's a much more lucrative position to be in yep. than to be a farmer, right? It's yep. not this ideal state of being to be a farmer, right? Like it's really hard work. Yeah. So and if you're lucky enough to have land, then. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So good for you. Yeah. So it really has us questioning the support of this type of quality of life okay. is really where we're at. Yeah. And Mike and the crew at Root Shoot are, are definitely like spreading the word about uh, preserving the farmland. Spreading the love. Spreading the love. So the family, uh, right now we own about 200 acres here okay. in northern Colorado. Okay. But we're farming and leasing about 2,000. So wow. it fluctuates every year a little bit on the acreage that we're able to mm -hmm. um, secure for the farm. Um, and on the farm, sure. we're growing barley, uh, a couple varieties of wheat, uh, rye, oats, um, alfalfa, and then corn for the distillery. So we have quite a few things in the ground located here in northern Colorado. And we're not all centrally located here at this space on the farm. We're kind of spread out all over Berthoud and Loveland. Okay. And a lot of that it just has to do with, you know, where we own the property and then where we're leasing the property sure. as well. Sure. And, I, and I'm sure that you saw the Bucky's coming up. Yeah, oh yeah. Uh, that used to be our farmland. Oh. So that was a Congrats. lease. Well, no, oh. Not, oh, no, it was not, leased. Oh, <laughs> it was okay. leased property. Yeah. And so when Bucky's uh, decided to build their facility, they pulled the lease on it, that oh, farmland yeah, for us. Right. And at one time, that was the most productive farmland for this operation, which is, you know, that's where it becomes almost a pinch point for the farm and us is we, since we don't own that land, we're kind of at the mercy of what's going on. Northern Colorado is a very desirable place to live. Yeah. And so the price of land um, and securing any of that is almost unachievable for us. So um, we have to figure out ways to do better with what we have and still maintaining our balance every year of farmland. So. Mm -hmm. I think um, you could probably hint on, not hint on, but talk a little bit to uh, the 100 year. Mm -hmm. Is it the 100 year plan? The, uh, the hundred year, year lease. Lease, okay. And how maybe I was going to say that for the end, but talk a little bit to the hundred year lease and what people can do to help support that, so we don't sure. hear more of these stories okay. coming um, up. So farming is not a very lucrative position. People are not 
standing up, waving their hands, saying, I, I want to be a farmer, right? Uh, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of long days. It's a lot of planning. Um, and it's just not as lucrative as some other things. So there are families in this area that have been farming it for a long time that are now stepping away from the farms and yeah. their children are not farming it yep. any longer. So it becomes more lucrative to sell their land to developers than it is to farm it. Uh, we've partnered with Colorado Open Lands to help secure some of that land and put it okay. into uh, conservation easements sure. so that way it can remain in farm land forever. It cannot be developed. Um, so we've started moving our own farms that way okay. and talking to some of the farmers around us that we're also farming their land to help them or at least to introduce them to these ideas of, hey, well, we want to maintain some of our our food integrity, our food sources, and we want to just make sure that this is going to stay farmland forever. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the idea of the 100-year lease is to try to bring some, um, just my more, more thought, more eyes onto it, talk about it a little bit on how farmland is disappearing right. and very viable farmland around yeah. here. And if you own that, it, like I said, it's more lucrative to sell it, right? Easy money, right? I guess. <laughs> um, I, so, what can what can our viewers do to help support that if they're interested? Um, yeah, um, I mean, Colorado anybody? Open Lands is yep. an organization that okay. they can reach out to. Okay. Um, we have some resources on our website that okay. kind of explain uh, what's going on there. Uh, we're starting to have these conversations about what we're going to do to mark our hundred years of farm. So sure. we're talking about maybe releasing a single barrel of whiskey that's, you know, picked sure. by the team that's the best. And maybe some of that funds goes back sure. to the open lands or malting something very unique where we're giving back some of that just to help, you know, raise attention to it. So there is this way of life and this quality of life that goes into the root shoot ethos. Gotta admire it, and I freaking love it. And it's this product of malt that's getting put out there, right? So what we're going to learn next is uh, that germination and the steeping process of malting, right? Root shoot has a steep tank and three drums that they use to churn out the malt product. Huge. Huge, yeah. I, so if, I, if I'm hearing you right, we're actually going to go through the next steps and the steps of germination. And yes. like how that all goes, how that all works, right? Yeah, and it's going to be the beginning stages of it, right? It's not only the germination process, but how they use hot steeping for quality assurance, quality control that they're putting out this good product. All right. So it takes us seven days to go from raw barley or raw wheat or raw rye, whatever the product is. Um, it takes us seven days to go from start to a finished product. Wow. So. And how much are you doing every seven days? So we have three drums and we're generally turning them over every two days. Every so one two. comes out Monday, one comes out Wednesday, one comes out Friday, and then we just rinse and repeat the next week. Wow. Um, that's the goal. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, it, but there, we're running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, generally, we're only shutting her down for like Christmas and sure. Thanksgiving and stuff sure. like that. So. All right, Mike, talk to me about what we got going on here. I, I see a one, I see a two, I see a three. I see some different stages of what we're looking at here. Okay, so uh, basically these are just samples from each one of the drums. So drum one, two, and three, uh, which you'll get to see a little bit later. But what we have is uh, basically our pale ale that we make, Genie Pale, and it's in three different stages. So drum one is, um, it is the furthest along in germination here. Okay. And so you see a lot of rootlet growth in there. Uh, it's really soft. It, you can squeeze it in your hand. Um, there's something interesting. Uh, I don't know if we're quite there yet. But if you take a kernel and you smear it in your finger um, and it leaves this paste-like material, then it's about ready to uh, go to malting or go to kilning. So this is considered, this is a technical term. It's called malter's thumb. Um, but that's how they've determined when barley is ready to go to kiln for ages. So basically you just want to make sure all those starches are made in the right. inside of that kernel. So this one's the, mo the furthest along and it will go to kiln tomorrow. So we'll start drying it out. Um, and then drum two transferred over on Wednesday. So it's a little earlier in the process of germination. So the grain's still, uh, still soaking in some of the moisture. We're still applying water to it to get it to its target moisture level. Um, but you see like the rootlets on there are really bright and white and it's starting that 
those beginning stages of starting to sprout. Okay. Um, and then drum three, which just emptied today, actually has finished product in it. So this will move over to our packaging side. Uh, it has already today, but this is basically a finished product here. So you're dry uh, at like 3%. And then this is, it just needs to be cleaned and put into bags and then it can be delivered to the breweries. Okay. And so uh, to accompany the finished product, uh, we have base, what's called a hot steep. So the American Society of Brewing Chemists came up with um, an evaluation method to test finished malt. So this is the liquid format of this. Okay. So basically you're just making a little mini mash in a thermos and you're holding it for about 15 minutes at 149 degrees and you're just you know, emulating that mash profile. Then you filter it through this and what you get is the actual liquid of what this is. So this is really, we're basically just making a tea out of the grains. Right. And so we do this for just a value, product evaluation. So we're making sure that it's, um, you know, if we're making a Pilsner malt, that it's nice and light in color. Yeah. If we're making a Munich malt, we wanna make sure that color is right. Uh, but this is Genie Pale and so our target is between two and three on the color range. And yep. this, this batch came out at 2.8, so we're right in the threshold there. Beautiful. But it's really nice, beautiful, golden color. You know, should have all the toasty profile that Genie Pale is pretty much known for. What the heck is Genie Pale? I keep seeing Genie Pale. What is that? And what, is, what does that grain have to do with community and collaboration to its finest? And, and also, they're operating in Colorado. Like just Colorado, or I want to do mine again. I like it. Also, are they up? Oh, and they have one right there. So, are they just operating in Colorado, or can like you know get their get the Genie Pale elsewhere? Is what is Genie Pale your most popular? So Genie basically? Pale is consists of not quite fifty percent of what is leaving this facility. So it is our largest, our fastest moving grain. Um, Genie Pale has a very interesting uh, genesis story. So Station 26 is one of our original partners awesome. from starting from scratch here. They were very interested in what we were doing. Um, and so at that time, Todd would make a batch of Genie Pale and we would deliver it to Station and they would brew with it and then they would give us feedback on it. Okay. And so Todd would make some changes and whatever it was, the kilning, germination profile, whatever their feedback was, mm -hmm. and then we would remake it, re-deliver it, they would brew with it, wow. give us the feedback, and we just tweaked it until one day they were like, yes, that's it. That's what we want. Cool. Um, it's also won, I think, four craft malting medals. Very cool. And how many how many breweries are you reaching out to? Like how? So we fluctuate a little bit, somewhere between like 125 to 135 breweries or just like in and out. Um, just here in the state of Colorado. Okay. Uh, and then we have about a dozen distilleries that we work with as well. Wow. Um, so we do ship some stuff out of state. It's very low, low amount. The density of breweries and operations here in Colorado is so much bigger <laughs> than everywhere else. For sure. Right? So we're just, you know, we're, we're a small team doing this. And so reaching outside of our own state is just a challenge. So we've kept it in state for the most part. Sure. We did our first international shipment last year. We sent a couple pallets down to Honduras to a brewery wow. there, which was super exciting. Pretty yeah. cool. Do you uh, hand deliver it? No, I wish. <laughs> I tried to get that worked into the schedule. It just didn't happen. <laughs> Okay, so things are about to get really exciting because now we're going to step into the wild, wild wonder of the world of the malting facility yeah. itself. And, and this facility was absolutely incredible. The machinery is huge, it was loud, it was clean. The sheer size of this was kind of hard to even fathom. It's wild, it's wild. So like you said, there's three drums inside. Each drum weighs about 36,000 pounds. And then on top of that, they put 20,000 pounds of product into it. That doesn't even account for the water weight. Just, yeah. just think of like the size of the thing. So you're going to see it. It's so exciting. And so the tour itself is going to take us from literally from start to finish yeah. of this malting process, from, from steep to germination to kiln to roast, right? All those different steps, all driven by three magical elements. And they are time, temperature, and moisture such an incredible tour and experience the whole thing like had no idea what to expect going in and it blew me away oh yeah 
All right, here we are in Prime Central Station. Talk to me, what's going on? So what you're looking at here are drums one, two, and three. One, two, three. And then the steep tank, which is another piece of equipment. So this is a conical shape, very similar to what you see in breweries. Uh, yeah. It has a little bit of a different function. So how the, how the malting process begins is we load our steep tank with 20,000 pounds of raw material. Once it's loaded, we fill it up with water to the top and we start the soaking process of the grains inside of that vessel. Okay. Um, it stays wet inside of there with the water for roughly, I don't know, four hours or so. Oh. And then we drain out all the water. What happens is the material thinks that it's now time to grow. Like it's at a good temperature of the earth, like low 60s. Um, so it thinks we're basically just tricking it into growing. Really. Sure. What happens is we start to generate a lot of heat inside of that vessel. Sure. So we go from low 60s to it starts to push up towards 90 degrees inside of there just on its own energy that it's creating sure. through that growing process. Cool. Uh, but once we've let it sit in there dry, we then hit it with water again and fill it all the way back up. And we start to run some air through the bottom of the vessel. So what that does is it pushes the air up through the bottom and it creates this boiling effect inside of that vessel. And it's not boiling, it's just moving, the air is just working its way up and moving. Okay. Uh, it's basically making sure that everything is very homogeneous inside of that vessel that everything has access to the same uh, water okay. and that we don't have dry spots in okay. there uh, and putting sense. a little bit of oxygen inside of that water for the barley or wheat or rye or whatever it is. Um, so then we start watching the moisture content of the grains and we are looking for about 40% for our operation before we move it over into one of the drums. So what we do is we start pulling samples and we just wait till it hits about 40%, pull the trigger to move it out of the water into one of these vessels here, the drums. Okay. Now the, the drums itself are shaped, uh, it's like a mash tun, it's like an elongated mash tun. So there's a false bottom that runs the length of the drum. Uh, when we transfer over all the water and the grain, all the water seeps through that false bottom sure. and comes out a drain and all the grain stays up on top of it. Yeah. You don't want to leave water on the grain in excess because then you start to have molding and spoilage sure. issues. Sure. So if you think of the drum, it's basically a, providing a controlled environment uh, for us to germinate and grow whatever wow. the material is. Um, so the total process of steeping takes about a full day, 24 okay. hours. Okay. Um, that was my question. And it's very grain dependent as well. So not all barley or wheat or rye behaves the same inside of these same parameters. Like they're all a little different from okay. each other. Like we used to malt um, a barley variety called Odyssey and it was a very um, dense kernel that liked to be underwater compared to like Genie. Genie doesn't like that much water. Okay. So we shorten that time frame for Genie but we elongate it for Odyssey. The drum allows us to control the exact temperature, the airflow, the air mixture, humidity, and then we can put water directly onto the grain bed inside of that vessel. Okay. So we are just uh, making sure that we're providing the most, the best opportunity for it to grow as consistent as possible. Okay. Because once you if, you, if you're not doing that, when you lose some of that consistency, you lose the consistency in the product downstream, sure. right? So you just get inconsistent results. Sure. So yeah. the idea is to treat all every kernel of that 2,000 pounds or 20,000 pounds the exact same so that it has the exact same opportunity to grow at the same pace. So once we're germinate, we germinate for about five days. Uh, and then we turn on the heat and the air and start drying it out inside of that vessel. Okay. So applied heat, um, and what we do is to make different products, we change a couple of those parameters. Okay. Basically, we have three levers that we can change okay. to make something different. Okay. Time, temperature, and moisture. And so if you change those in any one direction, okay. you can get something different out. 
So if you want to make a Munich malt, like something that's darker, has a little bit more color, more flavor, you want high heat, high moisture, because it creates that browning effect sure. on the grain. So sure. like if you think about butter and toast, sure. like that's the same concept in here. So basically, uh, temperature, moisture, darker grains? Yep. Uh, but they're all about on the same time length? Um, so when when we start to run some of the darker malts, because the heat is so intense, okay. we actually shorten that kilning cycle up a little bit. We make a distiller's malt, which is our lightest colored malt, yeah. and that's basically being air dried with very low applied heat, where we make like a honey malt, which is dark and very complex, and that the time frame between those is probably like 12 hours of kiln wow. time. What, what's the temperature then? So usually it's about 200, 225 on the, on the honey malt, which okay. is the darker. Right. And then it's probably about 150 for the distillers. So what is that, 75 de degrees of difference between the right. lightest to the darkest? So yes, the equipment is totally bonkers. And if it isn't obvious, I am 100% smitten at this point in the process. And wildly, it gets better. I didn't know it was possible to melt in person live. Here we go. So we've learned three magical words. Time, temperature, water. And moisture. That's my bad. It should be moisture. Sorry. Hey, we'll do it again. Yep, sorry. Time, temperature, moisture. You got it. But there's actually a fourth variable to this equation. Can you guess what it is? Uh, Air Jordan. Close. Less the half. Air. That's right. Sir Airness. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you what, by this time I totally needed some air because it was so hot. It was toasty. It, it was, was hot warm. in there. <laughs> so what we're, what we're going to do is open up the bottom of okay. drum two. Okay. And what you're going to see is, is basically nothing. It's empty space in there. But you're going to be able to fill the air flow through there that then is seeping up through the grain bed. We're just opening a port for it to escape now. So it'll be kind of intense on the... Uh, on the wind factor because it's just trying to get through. Sweet, I'm hot uh, anyway. So how the drum works is we take air from outside okay. and we run it through a chiller to cool it to get it down to about 60 degrees. 60 degrees. And then it's forcing its way into the vessel through the bottom, seeps up through the grain bed and exhausts out the back. So As it heats up. Yep. Yeah. So the the byproduct of the malting process is heat and CO2. That's what's being generated okay. inside of these vessels. So the idea is that, uh, the idea and the beauty of our equipment is that if we want it to be 60 degrees inside of that vessel, it will self-regulate the temperature to hit that 60 degrees. So if it senses that the grain bed is starting to heat up and get a little bit out of control, it'll turn the fans on and run the air through the air, basically a, a chiller before it feeds in cool. and it'll start cooling itself down. Is that what sets it apart then when you called it the Cadillac of systems? Yes, it okay. gives us a lot okay. of control over okay. all those processes. Basically, I mean, when you boil it down, some farmers that don't know how to malt, all the bells and whistles on how to do it the best to their abilities, right? Yeah. You know, they were not leaving anything to chance. They wanted to figure it out and this gave them the most opportunity to do something consistent. And this is how you they planned it out, right? Like we built it this big because we were putting three drums right. in, we were putting the one steep in, yep. this is how it was gonna be. So that's where this okay. uh, operation is optimized at. Okay. So we have one burner and one steep tank and both of those can power all three drums. Wow. If you wanted to add a fourth, you would have to go to six because that's where it's optimized it's at, right? Yeah. So. But it, what's really interesting is you can't cross streams with processes in here. So I can't kiln two drums at once, and I can't steep two batches. So you have to be very regimented in your processes on how you're achieving getting product sure. from A to B. That's the OCD dream right there. Yeah, I that's perfect. That. I love it. Yeah, okay. All right. I see you. I see you. All right. All right. Let's take a look. Okay. Did you hear that? I can't hear much. Oh, okay. Come Let's in a little it. closer. Get in. I want to feel the full force of the wind. <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs> so, oh, that feels so good. So what you're looking at is the bottom of the drum, and that's just empty space in here. 
So the drum, it actually shaped and it gets a little skinnier towards the back end. And that allows all that water to filter down to a drain that's located at the back end. Okay. Um, so that allows all the material to stay up top on that false bottom. Right. So when we close this, all that air doesn't have anywhere to go but up through the grain bed and then exhaust out. Uh, how big did you say the tanks are? Uh, 34,000 pounds empty, then we put in 20,000 pounds of material, but then we put the water weight on top of it, right. so it's heavy. Cool. If you're warm, stand here, because it feels very nice. Because it's been over 90 degrees the last few days, uh, everything is happening faster. So sure. a lot of the equipment is trying to cool everything down, right? So malting in the summer is different than malting so in the winter. Cool. In the winter, everything is cold. So your groundwater is cold. The grain is cold from sitting outside. The atmosphere is cold outside. Right. So what we're trying to do is in the winter, we're just trying to keep everything warm and push it along and move it along. So it actually takes longer to malt in the winter because you're just like, come on, let's yeah. go, let's go keep it, keep it warm. And in the summer, you're trying to suppress all that heat sure. because you have the inverse problems. Ah, he got me again. There's a fifth element to this process. Basically, we'll call this one the no clumping allowed. Think of how you dry out pumpkin seeds or adding milk to flour. What happens? It starts to stick together. Right, right. Did yeah. you notice those big ass chains around the machines? That's the first thing I noticed. Yeah, the machines turn. It makes sense, right? So movement is our fifth variable. Yeah, makes sense, right? But this is what it looks like inside of the drums. So what you're seeing is the moisture coming out that's generally sure. trapped in there. But you have the grain bed is maybe three and a half, four feet deep from basically here down to the temperature probe down there. Okay. So you have the false like back on this, and that's where all that air is escaping out of this vessel. So I see the auger. Are you uh, stirring it as well? So we're not. Um, that's to help get it in and out. Okay. So okay. what happens is when we pump it with water out of the steep tank, it'll collect. It comes through these pipes, and it'll collect right here. And so we need the we need space. So the auger turns on and runs to the back and helps move some of that product as it's uh, piling up okay. right here to create some room. Okay. So it takes about an hour to get all the material from out of the steep tank into the drums. That's, that's not bad. No, that's not bad not at all. Bad. So the drum itself, about every 11 hours, it rotates around. So if you're familiar with like uh, floor malting with people pulling the rake and they're basically mixing up the barley, the rotation of the drums is just the mechanical version of that turning. So we have to have a way to sure. turn the barley or else it will grow together in a 20,000 pound clump inside of this drum. If you recall at the beginning, we mentioned the tagline, so grow and deliver. Well, we're at the delivery portion of this part of the tour of root shoot. Well, the beginning of it anyway. So what we're going to learn is that root shoot functions off of one base malt, yeah. which ultimately they've mastered into 14 different products. Yeah. I mean, it, I love that they're the masters of it, but it, it feels a bit like they have all their eggs in one basket. Yeah. And, and that's nerve wracking yeah. for me. And that's basically Mike's words. Exactly. So. What we start to get into is that, okay, so they've mastered this art, but what about mitigating risk? What about stepping outside of your boundaries to uh, combat that all eggs and said one basket? This is the packaging shipping side of the warehouse. So this is where all the finished malted material goes. Okay. Um, so like I said, we're producing somewhere about 14 different varieties of malt. Okay. Um, whether that be rye, oats, uh, wheat, but we're all producing it from one base barley. And that, that's Genie, is the, is the species of barley. Genie comes from a company called Lima Grain, and they're a European company, and they just happen to have an office in Windsor where they sell seed from. So it's certified seed that we're growing. 
Um, and over the years of this operation, we've started with a dozen different varieties and we've whittled it down every year to Genie, just one. Cool. And so, you know, we're the masters at all these different phases. So it has to grow well out in the field. It has to malt well, and then it has to translate to the brewing and distilling side. And so as we've grown, we've eliminated things that have haven't grown well, sure. haven't malted well, haven't had a good reception in the marketplace. And sure. we've really hung our hat on that Genie Barley. And so we've also won a lot of awards with yeah. that grain as well. So it's kind of hard to deviate away from it because it does so well for yeah. us. Um, some of the things that we're looking into to kind of like move forward into the future is like to look at some of our raw materials. Like a couple, a couple years ago, we brought in some heritage grains that we okay. started growing. Uh, we're looking at some winter barley, which is not normally something that's grown here in Colorado. Okay. Uh, so we're just trying to, uh, a lot of it, a little bit of it is to mitigate some of the risk okay. because we have all eggs in that basket, right? So we're just trying to, you know, change the harvest times or the planting times a little bit to, you know, try to starve off the hailstorms. Um, right. Every year it changes a little bit. Um, this year our barley looks really good, really early. Okay. And so we're probably going to harvest earlier than we've ever harvested on the farm. Are you harvesting in August? So that's where we used to harvest. Okay. okay. Now we're like into the last weeks of July. Okay. So it's okay. just moving up every year. And it just, yeah. we're not really sure what to do. I mean, you can't, you can't fight yeah. climate change, right? No. No. And all no. we can do is look at some of our practices mm -hmm. um, and try to mitigate a little bit of that risk through that format. Okay. So, but as we're getting closer to that hundred year mark for our farm, now yes. we're really talking about doing something different, like just either growing a heritage variety of barley from the Czech Republic and bring it in. We've That'd been be talking cool. to Coors, like trying to get the very first Moravian that they planted here in Berthoud. Like, you know, we're just yeah. trying to try and think of some really cool, cool stories, cool products, just try to create some diversity in our lineup. So. I guess I didn't think about that earlier when you said it started with Anheuser-Busch and Coors. So you're still uh, growing for them so while you're now doing this as well? We have stopped growing okay, for okay, them, okay. Uh, but we do sell our malt to Coors okay. uh, wow. in specific. So the Colorado Native Series yeah. is made with grains that we malt here. Wow. So they make a lot of beer and a lot of really good beer. Yes, so do. those are the most technical brewers in the world yep. brewing with our grains. That's and it's kind awesome. of like a feather in the cap. Oh my gosh. Know? It's pretty cool. So fresh and so clean, clean. Like what, is the, it, what does that mean to you? Like the song? I mean, yeah, but the last part of this packaging journey, I mean, is the cleaning and freshness that really shines when you walk into this place. I mean, cleanliness, it matched no other. Yeah. You know, it, it was absolutely incredible. The floors were so clean, literally by the milling machine itself. Yeah. So they take every opportunity to clear it out, whatever they can do by the Mega Maid. The Mega Maid. I would have eaten off that floor. Absolutely. No doubt. Would have been totally fine. It was so clean in there. That's like the, one of the first things both of us said when we walked in. And and on top of the cleanliness, the freshness, right? Like what a huge piece. I hadn't even really thought about the fact that they can get grain to a brewery on their doorstep within two weeks. Yeah. Like it, it's just so fresh and the type of impact that makes uh, in, in the example case of fresh bread versus store-bought. Like we all exactly. know fresh tastes better and it's showing in a premium product. Exactly. It's a beautiful story. When a batch finishes out of the drum, okay. it empties into one of these silos oh, right. on the back side here. Okay. So this is where the, the malt goes to rest until we're ready to package. Uh, once we're ready to package, we run the malted barley through this cleaner here. And so what it is, is it's a series of screens and shakers. Um, and airflow through there that's pulling out some of the loose material, broken kernels, um, rootlets, acrospires, anything that uh, is unwanted right. pretty much in the final product. Yeah. If you're not starch, get out. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we, we send it over here to the, basically this is a hopper for the packaging line. Yep. Uh, we can mill for some of our customers oh. uh, don't have mills in their operation, so we do some milling for them. And then the majority of what we do is 50 pound bags out the door. Mm -hmm. um, some of our larger customers, 
uh, Upslope, Coors, Station 26, Prost, they all take uh, what's, what's called super sacks. And so these okay. are 2,000 pound bags of malted barley. Easy. So instead of a 2,000 pound pallet, yep. uh, we're set, sending these. And, and basically that's just a labor savings for the brewery. Right. right? They don't right. have to open 40 right. bags to get the same. They have 16,000 pounds that they ordered. So basically a full turn out of one of the drums is what they've ordered. A full turn, wow. Um, and that will be their keg beer, their uh, packaged beer that's in distribution. So. Wow, that's incredible. Who runs the trucks? Do you guys run that operation yep. as well? Wow. So what makes this operation really unique is that we're vertically integrated. Wow. Right? So we're sowing, we're, we're growing it, and then we're delivering it on top of that. Brilliant. So, so Todd selects the seed puts it in the ground, tends to the soil, runs the farm. We harvest it ourselves. We store it here on site. We clean the raw materials here. We then malt it and we package it and deliver it as well. So there's, wow. you know, a, a, only a few sets of hands touching this product before it reaches the breweries. Um, and we're doing it in a very fresh format too. So we're delivering malt that is so fresh to some of these breweries that they've never had it that fresh, right? right? So if you think about um, purchasing grain from Europe, like Germany, uh, you know, it's historically where the best malt comes from in the world, mm -hmm. right? But that malt is created in Germany in, in a warehouse, shipped to the port, gets on a boat, comes to the United States, sits in warehouses until it's distributed out to the breweries. So you're looking at like maybe an eight month time span yeah. by the time that yeah. breweries get it and you know that's fresh for that but when we're delivering malt that's a couple weeks old there's a sensory difference in what the beers that they're creating you have higher extract because it's fresher it hasn't been sitting down mm -hmm. or sitting for a long time sure. right and then you just have the aromatics coming out of that and the sure. brewing process and the, everything is just i mean it's better it's like fresh yeah. bread yeah. versus Store-bought bread, yeah. really. So this is the small cleaner, this is the big cleaner? So this is the big cleaner. Okay, so do they have when, names? Uh, I haven't named them yet. Oh, you should. <laughs> you don't have to, I we, would. <laughs> we, we have, uh, I'll show you when we get outside, our okay. uh, air handling, basically, um, we're collecting all the dust, and dust material from all the uh, open points in this, and we refer to that as Mega Made. If you're a okay. Spaceballs fan, yeah, I know who I know who Mega Made is. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this is the cleaner for the raw materials. Um, so any of the barley or wheat or rye that come through, we, this is the first step of the cleaning process. So this is just a really gigantic version of that, where you mm -hmm. have more screens, more airflow, and mm -hmm. it's removing more material. So you think like grasshoppers, sticks, bugs, anything that's Mice. basically came oh. out <laughs> off of the field right yeah, when yeah. they harvested all yeah, the sticks yeah, yeah. and twigs and. Um, Where I come from, that's just silage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. You're cleaning, you're milling, it's setting. It's pretty clean in here. It is pretty clean in here. Talk, talk to us about your <laughs> air filtration. You yeah, gotta... uh, so we, we collect at every open point, uh, we collect the dust, right? Just through, uh, we have a giant cyclone out back that helps okay. keep, keep that's what the dust saying. down. Right. Okay. Right. So, and then we also work very hard to keep this place as cleanly as possible. It's awesome. Right, thank you. I, I mean, I think that was the first thing I noticed when we walked in. I think we were all on that point, especially Chelsea, and it was like, okay, like, I can get on board with that. Like, yep. kudos, man. Cleanliness um, is great. Yep, we try to keep it very clean and very organized, right? It's, and it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. It's very obvious. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I want to see the maid. And, well, let's go outside. Yeah. I want to bring my roller skates through here. That's how clean uh, it is. Before we finish the oh, yeah. side of the building, I used to bring my longboard and just skateboard around here. I mean. I mean, what else are you going to do with all that space? Yeah. Okay. So they are stewards of the land. This is where we're at in our journey and our tour in this story. We've heard this all of our lives, but anything worth doing is worth doing right and oftentimes that begins with a strong foundation and when it comes to farming that really all begins with the soil with the land think about that for a minute and let it sink in like what you're eating what you're drinking like what you're breathing you know think about the land the next time you sit down and you're raising a pint think about where those malts come from to quench your favorite beer thirst okay 
Wow. So when harvest happens, it comes directly to the malt house. Okay. So we're talking like this field here that is on the back side had barley on it last year. Okay. So when you're talking about reducing your carbon footprint, we're going like 20 yards from the field yeah. to where we're storing it okay. to the malt house, right? So uh, bin seven, eight, and nine house the harvest, and that's about three million pounds of raw material for us, raw barley, uh, between all three of those. Wow. Um, and so bins 10 and 11 here are how we move the barley around to get it clean. Okay. So I'll load up 10 with the dirty barley from the field. Okay. It then travels through the International Space Station here <laughs> and into the building. Okay. Through the cleaner and then comes back out into number 11 there. Okay. And so then I move barley from number 11 to these six silos here, which okay. is basically our operating clean barley. Okay. Um, so we, if we're running full blast, I basically have two weeks worth of material to run with before I have to fire this stuff up here. Wow. So when you're thinking about 20,000 pounds and the drum size, and you look at this silo right here, each one of these silos is a batch. So if you think that that's filled with grain, that's what's going inside into the drum. So everything in this operation is very uh, silo specific, sure. right? They're all they're all equally sized, so that way we know what we're doing. Three million pounds. Yes. How are you keeping up with demand? Uh, we haven't quite hit demand okay. on all three drums yet. Okay. Um, we're working our way there. Yeah. Right. Slow process. Um, we right now we are at we are appropriately sized for our farm. Um, so we are not going to grow the malting business any further because we don't have the farmland yeah. to support yeah. it. So we have to be very mindful on how much we're growing every year, crop rotation, uh, what we're doing out in the fields and trying to balance everything that we have. Um, and on the farm side, we're planning six years in advance, right? So the malt house is a little, it's a little more micro plan, but uh, compared to the farm, sure. but we have to be very mindful of where we're placing crops and uh, not growing the same thing on the same land because yep. that helps, yep. that reduces quality over time. Yep. It helps uh, introduce diseases out into the field. So yep. um, just trying to make quality decisions as farmers for the products that we're growing. Right, so the whole idea of this operation is to provide high quality grains for the brewing and distilling industry. And mm -hmm. so we start with the soil that we're farming with. Right? Yeah. So we partnered a couple years ago with a company out of Boulder called Mad Ag, and they've been helping us introduce some regenerative soil practices on the farm side. So just to give you an idea, yeah. we harvested barley off of this field last or two years ago, last year. I don't remember which one it was. I think it was last year. It's so, alfalfa right yeah, now, isn't it? It is alfalfa yeah. right now. Yeah. So once we harvested it, we put peas and uh, turnips directly into the soil. Okay. Right? And we let them grow from the end of the summer until basically the winter. And we had zero plans on harvesting any of that material. Well, the peas uh, are replacing some of the nitrogen in the soil and then the turnips are naturally decompacting the soil for us. So instead of tilling sure, it, we're letting sure. that naturally happen, right? So it dies out in the field. Um, and then we brought some head of cattle through and they graze. So yep. you're creating some natural fertilizer yep. out in the field and they're trampling stuff down sure. and mixing it up, getting all the nutrients back into the soil. And the idea is that when we go back into that field, uh, with barley the next go round that we will have a higher quality sure. harvest, right? Because sure. we've done some work to the soil to make sure that we're not just stripping the soil of all of its nutrients, right? We're just trying to be good stewards of the land, but think long term that we have to take care of what we have because we may not have it, yeah. right? And so if we can put some practices into place now cool. that can ensure a higher quality product down the line, we're, we're gonna we're gonna do that. Oh right? yeah, because it's it's very self-serving for us. But, Absolutely, right? I love I love the the peas and the turns. I mean, that's not dumping a bunch of chemicals back Correct. into it or anything yep. to try and get it to be better. That never and does anything. No, and then to wow. just take a step off of that, we a couple of years ago the price of fertilizer had skyrocketed, right? So 
Todd worked with another company to help develop our own fertilizer. So he's actually making his own compost on another plot of land uh, that we're out there turning the compost every day. So awesome. some of the materials generated sure. from this operation are then being composted by us that, that are then being re reapplied to the land. So we're that. trying trying to do all those pieces and still keep the farm running and the malting operation going and just trying to find ways to do things different and better. And it's a, it's a little different because during like October, you look around and we have the only fields with material on them. Sure. And so a lot of the farmers around us think that we're crazy. So as our tour starts to conclude, let me take a brief moment to geek out a little bit on how cool this farm really is. Oh my God. I can't wait for you to hear this. Yeah, I don't mean to geek out, but so far that's my favorite part. Wait. Not that the other stuff isn't really cool. Like I said, I love, I love the process, but to be, and it's never a dull moment, right? Like you're yeah. constantly implementing the next step. It's just yep. like one foot in front of the other. Yeah. And, and it's so symbiotic because everything affects the next thing. Yeah. I Holy mean, shit. It's, it's super interesting because, you know, we're now making, uh, Todd's making worm tea over on the farm. So he's got these big bins that he's got worms in and he's the cat. I don't even know all, all the things into it, but he's just trying, trying some different things to just, you know, wow. do better. It's, what about it's really all an experiment every day. You know, with the, the companies that were on the regenerative agriculture piece, they're coming out and they're taking shovelfuls of dirt sure. and counting worms. Sure. Like, and it's really, you know, I've been running this operation for six years and six years ago when it rained, we never had worms on the sidewalks and stuff. Nice. Now when it rains, there are worms that are like this big Sweet. and they are everywhere. <laughs> like enough that I have to get a broom to get them off of the pavement oh. before they dry. Like oh. that's how different the soil has gotten around our malting facility. It's sure. just as an observer, it's a very interesting change that you know, you notice over time. Absolutely. This never used to happen. Yeah. Where are these worms? <laughs> yeah, where from? and how are they so big? Because there's a lot of good stuff <laughs> in the ground. Very cool. And then last year we had barley on site here at the malt house, which was the first time that we've ever had that. Okay. Which is pretty exciting because we're, you know, it's oh yeah. The proximity of what we're doing. But there's is, some good pictures. Yeah. Um so being good stewards of the land. You know, there is a crop rotation that has to happen. Yep. So we go barley, corn, and then alfalfa for four years. So if you think about it, the land is locked up in a six year cycle. Um, at least that's where we're at now. Wow. Uh, so this will maintain uh, alfalfa for the next three more years, and then we'll go back into barley. I was trying to imagine on what life cycle is that. I don't know. Yeah, right? I, like... this farm has grown a lot of things over the years, like yeah. all the way down to popcorn. Uh, just lots yeah. of things. Yeah. Well, you can't live without popcorn. <laughs> if you can, we're not friends. So this may come as a surprise, maybe not, but they're not all about the beer there. They are also about the whiskey. Oh, I like the whiskey. The whiskey. Uh, and they're really digging their teeth into one of the newer styles in the whiskey market, which is going to be the single malt whiskeys. Yeah. Right? So a lot of places kind of shy away or people shy away from the price of it because the most expensive part is going to be the roasted barley on right. it where right. they have direct access to it and Makes so sense. they're like yeah let's just dive in on this world and they've done pretty well already for a whiskey that's kind of like it's on the market but not like really well talked about yeah. but they uh they might have an award or two with it oh so my you'll have to chime in next week as we're gonna drop that little story uh in our on our off week of this episode so you can learn about uh their their whiskey that they're pumping out. And it's so good. And we, available we in various it. locations. It's delicious. We had been talking to some distillers and we basically struck up a deal that um, we would provide the distillery grain. They would distill it, store it, uh, put it in their warehouse, sit on it for a while. And when we went to bottle it, we would create a product and we would split things 50-50. So some of that malt that we first produced from this building are now part of what is now our root shoot single malt whiskey. Yeah. Right. And so single malt has become a big deal in the whiskey world because it's the newest um, style, official style huh. of whiskey okay. uh, that's being recognized. Okay. Um, so it's good. There are not very many producers of single malt whiskey. 
So it's pretty small classification, mostly due to price of malted barley. Okay. Um, so a lot of distilleries don't, they buy, they make bourbon because bourbon's cheaper, corn is cheaper, rye is cheaper. Malted barley is the expensive portion, right? Oh, yeah. So that's what we have, we're making malted barley. I mean, I feel like my heart is exploding from that story. I can only imagine yours. I mean, you can just see your excitement through that whole interview because yeah. you just love the farming aspect. You love the fact that it's family owned. Like you just, you shined with Mike through that whole interview. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, but yeah, cool guy. yeah, I mean, that wraps it up. I mean, what an inspiration to see a family run operation. They can make such an important and significant impact on agriculture in a small area and within the, the craft beer space in a very big craft beer space for for our area yeah. right like yeah. uh like Colorado's known for it and yeah. these guys are really at a forefront of if you want to push your quality it comes from your ingredients and and i loved his example of if you want to talk about lowering uh some of your like your economic footprint right i mean it's going from oh 10 God. feet from the field literally right into their shop yeah. and it's just absolutely incredible so happy they let us come in and chat and truly learn an entire world that I, and I know you didn't either, had zero, zero clue. Like, like I, the amount of zero clue I had going into that was hard to describe. Like, yeah. I had no idea what to expect, and I was just in awe the whole time. Yeah. I'm not sure I thought it was possible for my heart to explode from any particular experience in the world, but I'm pretty sure my heart exploded that day. Yeah. I was just in love with everything that so they're cool. doing there at Root Shoot. So... They're in Loveland, right? Think about them the next time you're holding your glass in your hand. And think about how Root Shoot, after watching this, how they really exemplify that dedication, sustainability, and quality. Yeah. If you're a craft beer lover, remember that every single sip of a brew made with their malt, it supports their mission to preserve the farmland as well. So yeah. definitely something to think about, right? Think about all the steps that go into what they're doing there at the farm and, and more to come right like they're so ahead of the game like it's totally an ocd stream right there so yeah. big shout out to my thank you for taking the time to hang out with us and so sharing fun. the story and the incredible work that they're doing uh so there at root shoot yeah so and thank you to our listeners for joining us today and watching because that's probably the best part you get to see all those barley green fields i mean yeah. we're standing in a field of barley staring at the rocky mountains yeah giving you i think i died giving you sweet sweet gladiator shots with beers and barley <laughs> we're so funny i don't know i don't know how it gets much better than that it was it was such a such a cool day and hopefully you guys learned something new i mean that was i, I can't imagine we're the only people that that's kind of this foreign concept so it's really cool to hopefully share that with you guys and i thought you, hopefully you guys find it interesting and yeah. learning and as much fun with it as we did and there's cats so <laughs> worst case <laughs> Don't pet the these. cats. You can pet the cats, but only in the room where the cats are allowed. Right. Yes. They're working cats. They're working cats. They're working Always, gatos. They set off the, uh, the the system sensors. Yeah. And the alarms are very loud. They're very loud. Very loud. Very loud. I mean, it was loud in there anyway, but that was loud. It was very loud. Beep. Beep. All right. I could go on and on about that. Yeah. So we better cut it short. But we won't. <laughs> I think we already did. <laughs> we, we dedicated multiple hours and days oh. to making this video. Oh my God, so much time. This might be our most expansive one. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And after that, as per usual, we're uh, going to jump into the sips of wisdom. And uh, you're stuck with me this week, suckers. <laughs> Going back to the OG roots of the yeah, yeah. beer facts and history. Yes. Yes. See? And we're going to jump into fun facts about malts, about grains, some Makes of the machinery, sense. who invented them, Makes what sense. different grains do, awesome. what happens when you do different things with different grains. It's all about malts and, uh, you know, all the good things that it does for beer. I can't wait. So feel free to uh, uh, listen and uh, watch. Uh, Roll the footage! Roll the footage! In 1863, Charles Maitland, a Scottish brewer, actually patented 
the modern day mash turn. But this wasn't Charles's first patent. When he was working at a local distillery, he patented an apparatus for heating water more efficiently. But what made his mash turn patent unique wasn't because the water was heated more effectively. It was actually because he was wetting the grains earlier and quicker, which allowed for a quicker mash in because they weren't having clumps of dried up mash preventing everything from moving or needing this huge industrial machinery to turn everything. It allowed it to get wet sooner. They don't know when he came up with this idea, but it was completely revolutionary to modern day brewing. As we know it, it's, we still do those practices today. Have you ever heard of the Millard reaction and why does it matter for brewing? Basically what it is, is the amino acids and the sugars and how they change when cooked at high temperatures, similar to what they do with malts and they're getting roasted, right? This is how you get your darker beers. This is how you get your big, bold flavors. It's really similar to when you're cooking steak or you're roasting marshmallows and that dark browning that happens when you're cooking things at a high temperature and how it completely changes the flavor. It's exactly what happens when you're kilning malts. Did you know that the temperature of which malts are mashed actually directly affects the sugar outcome? Lower temperatures create more sugars. Higher temperatures create more complex flavors, but actually less fermentable sugars. Decoction mashing, have you ever heard of it? Because I had not. It's this really old school traditional way of brewing where you actually remove part of the mash, you bring it to a boil, you put it back in the mash to raise the temperature. Why do this? It's because it increases the flavors of the grains themselves. Uh, and it's often used in beers like Czech and German style lagers. Love that smoky flavor in a beer, but wonder how brewers get that? It is not from using liquid smoke. At least I hope not, because that'd be super, super gross. Even though, like, technically, like, the beer after is still kind of like a liquid smoke. But it's not the point. It actually comes from them roasting the barley over open flames. And that barley then absorbs the smoke flavors, of which those flavors transform into the beer itself. That you're drinking and love. Yum. But if you're not that into the smoky flavors, that's totally fine. It's an acquired taste. And if you're more into the sweeter beers, crystal malt is what gets the credit for that. How do they do it? They actually roast it while the malt is still wet, which crystallizes the sugars within the capsules themselves, which gives you that awesome toffee flavor that you like in some of those maltier beers that you love. Can't do gluten? Not a problem. Just start drinking beers that are brewed with either sorghum, millet, or rice. And you're fine. There's no gluten in them. Great, great, easy way to still drink some delicious beer. And lastly, a drum roll. What is a drum roaster and why do I care? It was actually invented in 1817 by Daniel Wheeler. Why does this matter? Well, if you like porters and stouts, this is the machine that allowed to get deeper roasts in the malts more consistently, drastically increasing the demand for these delicious dark beers from your malts because we're all about malts today. Oh, malts. This episode. Gah. Gah. That's all I got. All about the malts, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Oh, my God. That was quite the flavorful journey. Thank you. I worked really hard on these malts. Yeah. I was excited when I saw it. I was like, of course we're doing malts. It makes so much that sense, right? It's like we have this ongoing theme when we do these episodes. Weird. And it was really quite the spectrum, right? You went gluten-free, you went complexity of the decoction brewing, yeah. and really the science behind a lot of reactions that can occur when you're messing with the malts to make the beers. Patents, you know? Patents. Oh, read the patents there. Put the patent in Harvard Yard. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> the patent bar. Went over to the patent bar. The no. legal bar. Yeah. I was trying to make a Packer joke. It didn't work. Yeah, but pa Wisconsin's don't have a Boston accent. I just said it didn't work. Of course, I love the Packers. I'd do anything for the Packers. <laughs> the Packers. Have you listened to the Dirty Point Buck lately? Because you should. Mm, no. By the Dirty Bananas. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> well, there you go. Hopefully, learned something new. This was interesting for me. Oh, and yeah. Again, like, I just didn't really know a whole lot about the malt world yeah. and learning these inventions it was a great time hope you guys liked it oh yeah and with that we shall chomp our way into 
the bruising bites. Yes, welcome back to another week episode deliciousness on the bruising bites of the Body by Beer podcast. Every other week, we explore the fascinating world of beer and food pairings. So we uncover different flavors characteristics and how they can elevate even the simplest of dishes how simple speaking of simple today this week we're showing how malt and its diverse diverse profiles can transform macaroni and cheese aka mac and cheese aka little yellow elbow drops of goodness aka craft crack craft We're not making homemade Mac, y'all. We're doing craft crack. You can make this at home and you can experiment and you can see if you get the same uh, flavor profiles because we're all a little bit different, but but maybe it it, it takes it to a whole nother level. All of a sudden, it's it's not just a quick, easy meal from a box. It's an elevated beer drinking adventure. Oh, my God. I feel so elegant just thinking about it. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> a little blue box of goodness. Craft, you Craft. have my heart. Yep. So we're going to do uh, malts from the light biscuity sweetness of the pale ale to the rich caramel and nuttiness of a brown and the bold chocolate and coffee notes of a stout. And we're off to our flavor adventure. Now you know what's coming up. You're welcome. Here's and bites. Hey, everybody. I cannot wait to do today's beer and food pair. We're going with the super classic everyone has in their household. We've got three beers we're going with, and what's the food? Mac and cheese. First beer is gonna be wow, 90 shillings amber ale. Our second beer will be a nut brown ale from Nebraska Brewing Company. Our third and final beer will be a stout, but we only had sweet desserty stouts, so we're gonna go with Guinness. Stirring, We shall remove from heat. All the way back, so when tiny humans run by, they cannot grab handle of hot liquid and then add the butter. Use the corners of the pan, use the sides of the pan to melt with the milk. As everybody knows, there's an important test with mac and cheese, and it's to make sure it's not poisonous before you eat it. Um, I think it's good. It hasn't killed me yet. Let's go take this to the table and test it with some beer. So this amber ale has this beautiful copper color to it. It has this incredibly satisfying aroma deeply in part to those slightly roasted malts. Um, what's cool about this uh, this amber ale is it really lets the malt shine without the hops really overpowering to it. So I'm really excited to see how this is going to taste with the mac and cheese. Oh yeah. That slightly roasty, a little bit bready, Nice malty really complements the creamy cheesiness of the mac and cheese. It's almost like they were made for each other. All right, guys, so I got the brown ale, specifically a nut brown ale that I'm going to pair with mine. Really excited to see how the nuttiness goes with the different cheeses. A lot of vegan cheeses actually are based in like nuts and cashews and whatnot. So I think that's going to complement each other really, really well and really elevate and make the cheese the hero even more than it already is in mac and cheese. Because I like to shovel food in my mouth, I am going to use a spoon. Yeah, 
probably the, the, the nuttiness and the cheese makes the cheese does make it makes it basically not taste like powdered cheese. It actually tastes like kind of a homemade mac. Uh, it's really bringing that up together. Uh, it's chilling out the bitterness in the beer. So those are really complementing each other well. And honestly, considering I got a little one and a half year old and I eat mac and cheese all the time, this is a great way to elevate it at home. All right, last but not least for our mop profile, we have the Stout Classic Guinness. Um, it's going to exemplify flavors of roasty, chocolatey, dry, it should have a creamy mouthfeel. Really excited and intrigued to see how this is gonna pair with our mac and cheese. You had for the Guinness? Look at that dark, almost black color that the stout is giving us. I'm totally exciting. It's gonna bring a whole new dimension to our pairing. It's almost like a gourmet mac and cheese. It's like these deep, dark chocolate notes with the roastiness, with the bitterness. It's, it's contrasting, but complimentary at the same time, kind of harmonious with the creaminess of the cheese. Much better than I thought going into it. Out of this world, totally recommend. Can't believe how much the malt flavor is just like, so differently elevated this dish. All right, yes, this was a great way to elevate a really, really simple dish uh, with not adding any extra complexity, just adding what beers you probably already have around in the fridge, right? The, the malts of your amber, of your ale here are really gonna help elevate the cheese and the sweetness, uh, also cutting down on some of the bitterness. The nuttiness of the brown really made a big punch with the the cheese in itself and really made the cheese the hero. Uh, kind of had to eat it at the same time, like eat and drink at the same time. Uh, personal favorite by far was going to be the stout here. Uh, it really just made this taste like this incredible elaborate cheese that was on here uh, and just completely took it to a whole other level. Like I will be doing this pairing hands down. So remember when pairing beer with food, it's all about finding that balance and complementing flavors, even more so on the most simplest of dishes. So we're so happy that you joined us on this malt adventure with us today to take even the most simple of the simplest of dishes onto a totally elevated level. So that wraps up our tasty little treat of an episode on brews and bites. And we got to explore the different malt profiles and how they elevate your favorite craft mac and cheese. Crack, crack. Each bite should have been more enjoyable than the next, but uh, that's just us. We really like mac and cheese. We really like yeah. dissecting the malt profiles of these beers. So we hope you enjoyed it yeah. as well. I enjoy eating craft mac and cheese with the largest spoon I can find in the house and just I think, I'll, so I love your little kiddo very much, but I think one of my favorite parts is I also have a ladle that I use to eat yeah. mac and you gotta cheese You got to make with. sure it's not poisonous after you cook it, you know? Exactly, right? And We're the humble eat, servants to the queen. She can eat about a half a box of mac and cheese, which is great because I can down. eat a whole box. Yeah. So she's helping me out. I'm helping her Eaten out. so much more Kraft mac and cheese this last year and a half than I have <laughs> the last noticed, decade. If you've stocks have went up in the Kraft <laughs> industry. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, we, we wanted to take a little bit of a twist, so we hope you enjoyed this adventure of... Keeping it simple. Yeah, it's like simple, but maybe a little bit like additionally educational, yeah. simple. Any and everybody can do this. You don't yeah. have to have this elaborate meal, which we love cooking, so you're going to still get elaborate meals because we have a lot of fun with it. But, yeah. you know, simple and understanding how the malts can affect food at a low risk. And you just get to play around and have a couple beers, right? Like, there's two, three, four of you just open a can bottle and then split it. You don't have to drink the whole one to yourself. Right. So exactly. it, it's, it's a great way to explore moderation while you also explore your brews and bites. <laughs> Bring it back, baby. Yeah, let's yeah. go. Let's go. So if you <laughs> love this segment, please sure, please ensure to like and subscribe for more delicious pairings. And also, as we always have back here in the background, we should just open the scene with these just hovering. Liz wrote a lovely beer basics pairing book, which will give you more ways to explore how beers and food and everything goes together and makes things freaking delicious. And it doesn't say basic just because basic is an easy word to throw on a title because it's pretty basic. Simple <laughs> things like mac and cheese. Yeah. 
and just how it how it elevates. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's all so, about yeah. the elevated experience. Elevated experience. Links in below. You can buy a copy today. Liz has been crushing the sales on this. Keep oh, supporting, thanks. and it's been actually really incredible seeing that. Wild. Thank you book so much. Flourish <laughs> for the and support. People love it. And if you buy enough, and if you post in the comments, maybe you can like peer pressure her into another one. <gasps> oh. <gasps> oh. May peer pressure. May, may or may or may not be in the works. Oh my gosh! Peer pressure, guys. Yes, please. I love pressure. <laughs> and pressure. With- they don't have that pressure. We're going to go into a top 10. Shelby, this week's top 10 I'm really excited about. Oh, it's, yeah. It's a fun little twist uh, compared to like, hey, this is where you should go drink beer or this is where you should go do this. And instead, this is the top 10 things no one ever warned you about. Colorado Craft Beer Edition. <sighs> bah, go. Number 10. Beer festivals are actually a way of life. From big city events to small town gatherings, there's always a festival to attend, especially in the summer. Yes, so it's many. It's festival season. It's festival season. Number nine. We know wherever you're from, you've got great breweries from your hometown. They're not as good as they are here. That's right. Ours are better. Number eight. We have tried at home brewing. True. This is true. <laughs> Number seven. Yes, we do have a fridge. Probably in the garage. That's dedicated solely for storing all of our beer. Because we're part of eight beer of the month clubs. <laughs> Maybe. Mug clubs. All right. Number six. It's not just craft. We support all local. So oftentimes you should expect a stink eye for buying commercial unless it's outdoor gear related. And then it's fine. Thanks, sorry. Yeah. Also, course is fine. <laughs> Number five. We do have the highest breweries in the world and yes you will get drunker quicker up there the science can't prove it (laughs) i can prove it it has definitely (laughs) happened been there (laughs) been there done that mistake (laughs) are you hydrated today (laughs) that was good (laughs) number four expect without exceptions to pack a beer everywhere you go everywhere even on a hike or walking the kids walking walking the dogs Not behind everywhere. the wheel. Not behind no, the no, wheel. No, no, no. no don't but drink and everywhere drive. else, because we do walk and bike a lot of places too. No, you can't do that either. Shh. Can't do that either. Walking, you can. Put in a brown paper bag koozie. <laughs> That'd be a funny koozie. Make it look like a brown paper bag. Somebody surely has done that. Surely. Don't call me Shirley. Just slap a sticker on a brown paper bag and call it a koozie and be like, why is my bag wet? Because it's fucking cold. Not anymore. Well, the cold oozed out the, on your brown bag. Uh, my can is sweating and it got my paper bag wet. That's gross. I don't like it at all. Yeah, okay. So much for a tagline. <laughs> so much for a tagline. <laughs> Number two. Three. We drink on every... Oh, that's different. Okay. Number three. Yes. We will have a beer for any and all occasions, big or small, does not matter. We're probably going to have a beer during it. Finish the hike, have a beer. It's Monday. Have a beer. <laughs> it's walk Friday. To, walked out to your garage, to have your beer. beer fridge, have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Made it through the week, have 12. Have 12. All right. <laughs> Number two, without a doubt, there is a brewery within a mile in any direction. Yeah. There's a lot of breweries around here. They're they're everywhere. They're all over. I remember you little... can throw a cat and hit a brewery. Oh, don't throw a cat. But don't throw a cat. But you could hunt. Let me go. Anyways, I remember it was traveling and was like driving by this little strip mall area. It was like kind of industrial, kind of strip mall, and I was like, oh, I wonder what brewery is in there. And I was like, oh, you know, I know I'm from Colorado because there wasn't one. But that's immediately I was like, there's got to be a brewery in there. Lame. We should go stop and check it out. Oh, it's just like machinery. And that's stupid. Anyways, <laughs> that's my story about it. That's Proof there. my story. And number one. Sticking to it. Number one thing nobody uh, tells you about. Craft beer in Colorado edition. A 7% beer is considered a sessionable beer. Take that. 
Put on your big girl panties and deal with it. Yeah, enjoy yourself. <laughs> also could be why you get drunker faster at elevation. Yeah, 7% is sessionable. So there you have it. The top 10 things no one ever warns you about. Horns. Colorado Craft Beer Edition. Horns. 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 There's an abundance of beers. There's high altitude. There's quirky little things that we do and talk about here in this beautiful state of Colorado. Yeah. Um, it truly is one of a kind. Mm-hmm. Hope these insights give you a deeper appreciation for what makes our beer culture so unique. Whether you're cracking open a cold beer on top of a mountain. Or pushing the kid in a stroller. Pushing the kid in a stroller at the dog park. <laughs> <laughs> Never done that. Or exploring countless breweries around. Remember, you're part of something special. Speaking of special, oh. we got a bonus number 11. We also really love showing off how smart we are uh, while we're drinking yeah. in particular. And no one does it better. Then uh, shut up and drink trivia brought to you by our good friend and editor, editor, oh. Mr. Slamuel, Sam. Mama. Thanks, Sam. Check him out. If you guys are looking, if you're anywhere, either looking for trivia to do or looking to get trivia in your establishment, hit him up. He does good work. Good guy. Good work. All the fun stuff. Get him, Sam. Yeah. That's what we got. This is great. Great, 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 great. <laughs> We have a conclusion this week. Wow. Yeah. yeah well, again, it doesn't have to be verbatim. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I mean, but truly, what, what an incredible journey. This has been a great episode. I've learned a ton. Uh, really got to tap into a whole different industry market that we hadn't, hadn't didn't have Excuse a lot of knowledge me. about. Uh, and learn about innovative gel breaking down. Learn about athletic brewing, kicking some major ass. Major ass. And, uh, you know, Root Shoot. Love those guys even more than we already did. And, uh, don't forget our delicious beer and food pairings. Yeah, um, yeah. One of my personal favorites for every week. And honestly, I had a lot of fun with this week's top 10. Those quirky Colorado folks such as we. <laughs> Don't we have such a good time? Functioning beeraholics we are. Eh, still up for debate. <laughs> the beeraholic. Talk to my therapist about that one, too. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed this deep dive as much as we did. Remember, the craft beer world is always evolving, and always. there's always something to learn and discover. That's right. And if you loved today's episode as much as we did, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, share it with your fellow beer-loving friends. Um, your support means the world to us. Um, it helps bring you more and more exciting content every other week. So we appreciate you. Man, Thank and, you. And we just so broke 2,000. We did. See we those can... sweet, sweet push-ups? Yeah. Like, feeling the love, you guys. Thank you so Thank much. You. I mean, it is makes... Makes everything we do and all the work we put into it totally worth it to know that you guys appreciate it. You love what we're doing and uh, we appreciate you. And can't wait to keep growing that audience and hopefully do a beer and sports challenge against the Kelsey Brothers. Let's go. Ba, 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 ba.